for um, so uh, Arash sent you email of what to do if you uh, have questions about your uh, midterm. Uh, so he provided these two time slots when you can collect them from him and uh, uh, if you don't, uh, uh, we will probably leave them with the student office, but uh, this has to be s yet sorted out. So please try by all means to come uh, to this uh, two uh, time slots uh, to pick your midterm. And then if you have objections how your uh, uh, midterm has been graded, first go through this regular channel uh, <coughs> through Arash and if you are still unhappy um, after we finish the course, so in about two weeks time, right, we will, I'll have extra office hours precisely for uh, sorting out stuff regarding uh, uh, your marks on the assignments uh, and on the uh, midterm. Yeah, but because there are uh, all together with the web stream more than 400 students, uh, because there are more than 400 students, we have to do it first through this uh, uh, regular channel uh, so that uh, the amount of, uh, you know, corrections that I have to make myself is uh, uh, brought to some uh, reasonable feasible level, right? Okay, so let's get back to um, max flow. Let me just very quickly remind you how uh, Ford Folkerson algorithm works. So you pick any path through your uh, flow network, right? And you see what is the bottleneck uh, on this uh, path. So, for example, in this first path, the last leg, uh, the capacity four is the bottleneck, so the most what you can pump through this uh, path is four, and lo and behold, uh, you put this flow uh, on your uh, flow network graph, and then you construct what's called the residual uh, flow network, um, the edges now have the capacity that is the difference between the flow and maximal capacity of that pipe, right? So since you have here four out of 16, the capacity here is only 12 in this direction. But because you can reduce the amount of flow in the proper direction of the direction of the pipe, this is the same as having a virtual channel in opposite direction uh, whose capacity is precisely the amount of flow you have in the original graph because that's the amount that you can reduce the flow in the opposite direction, right? Now, once you construct uh, uh, this uh, uh, residual uh, flow uh, network, then you again look for any augmenting path. So any path whatsoever from source uh, to the sink, and then you update the flow by adding that amount. So in this uh, second graph, the uh, bottleneck is obviously seven, right? So uh, you will have a flow of seven now through this pipe. And um, um, all, the, uh, all the pipes that are involved in this augmenting path will be updated and the rest, of course, don't change. And you keep doing that for as long as uh, your residual flow network has augmenting paths. If you go through uh, these diagrams, you will see that uh, after adding this last path, the residual um, flow network has no longer augmenting paths. S simply, there are no paths from the source uh, to, uh, to the sink, right? 
and this is where the algorithm stops. And what we want to show now is that regardless what augmenting paths you chose, uh, the total amount of flow will be always the same. You see, if you change different augmenting paths, if you choose different augmenting paths, you might get different distribution of flow in different pipes, but the total amount of flow that leaves the source, uh, which is equivalent, of course, to the total amount that arrives uh, at the sink, will be the same regardless of uh, how you chose the augmenting paths, right? So uh, this is necessary, right, to show the correctness uh, of the algorithm. How do we do that? Um, oops, sorry. Um, first, of course, the f uh, procedure always terminates because each um, additional augmenting path increases the total flow. And since we assume that the capacities are all integers, it increases it at least for one. And of course, the largest flow uh, through the network is bounded by the largest capacity pipe that you have. And clearly, uh, since each step increases the amount of flow, eventually the algorithm will terminate. Uh, but we now want to show that, um, uh, that in fact, uh, the amount produced in this way will be maximal. Uh, so um, how do we do that? Uh, well, a crucial notion, it's a mathematical proof. Um, and it's based on the notion of a cut in a flow network. What is a cut? A cut is any partition of vertices, uh, right? So that uh, uh, every vertex belongs either to S or to T. Uh, no vertex belongs to both, so it's a disjoint partition. And uh, sync belongs to the left side, S, and uh, so sync and source are in different sides of the uh, partition. So the capacity of a uh, cut is simply some total of uh, the capacities of all pipes uh, that lead from S into T, right? So we only count uh, uh, forward uh, direction, right? So uh, only capacities of the pipe of the pipes that originate uh, in S and uh, terminate in T, right? So capacities, if this is S that contains source and this is T that contains sink, you look at all pipes that go in this direction and you do not count capacities that go in the opposite direction. And so some of capacities of all pipes that go from S to T is the capacity of the cut, right? Now, uh, the flow through the cut, on the other hand, is some total of flows that go in the proper direction from S to T minus whatever is returned from T to S. So when it comes to cut, we compute, we sum up only pipes in the proper direction, but when we compute the flow, of course, then we sum up the flow in the proper di direction and subtract the flow in the opposite uh, direction, right? Now, what is the most important observation about flows and cuts, right? Anything that flows from S to T, has to go through one of the pipes uh, that go across the cut, right? Anything that flows here has to go through, through these pipes. So this automatically means uh, the total amount of flow cannot, be, cannot exceed the sum total of capacities of the cut, right? Because anything that goes uh, any molecule of water, if you are pumping water, has to go either to this pipe, that pipe, or that pipe, right? So 
total amount of stuff that goes through the cut cannot exceed the total capacity of the cut because the flow in opposite direction can only reduce it, right? It cannot increase it. So uh, clearly every flow, if you plotted on a, a, a real fr from zero to infinity, so real numbers, non-negative real numbers, and if you ca plot all the flows, and if you go through all of the, if you have, if V is N, we know source has to be here, and thing has to be here, so how many cuts uh, do we have if we have N vertices? Uh, so these two guys are out of the picture because we know this one has to belong to S and this one belongs to T, but all other vertices you are free to distribute any way you want. Uh, so how many different cuts do we have? Uh? Two to the N minus one, minus two, right? So, because the remaining vertices can be broken uh, into left side and right side in any way you want, so obviously the number of subsets that uh, contain S defines then the number of uh, distinct cuts. So you will have lots of, so these are your flows, right? These are your flows. And say, uh, as we know, every cut, um, every flow is bounded by the capacity of any cut because for any flow, the flow has to go through all possible cuts, right? So if you pick any cut, the flow has, cannot exceed the capacity of that cut. So now the trick is, if you find one flow and one cut, so that the flow equals to the capacity of that cut. This must be max flow and the, and the cut must be mean cut, right? Because every flow is below every possible cut. So if you find a point in which a cut uh, meets a flow, well, this flow must be the largest and this cut must be the smallest. Now notice the definition of uh, minimal cut does not involve any flows, right? Because it's purely geometric notion. You simply partition all the vertices into two subsets so that uh, S belongs to big S and T belongs to capital T, right? Um, right, so, and then you look at the capacity of that cut, capacity of the pipes that go across you sum them up uh, and you take cut that has smallest such capacity. So obviously no flaw was ever mentioned in definition of the mean cut, right? Um, so if we find a flow that is equal to capacity of a cut, this flow must be maximal possible flow and the capacity of that cut must be minimal possible capacity. So uh, our strategy that to show that Ford Falkerson in fact produces maximal flow is that we will find a cut so that um, the, uh, the flow produced by augmenting pads uh, uh, is uh, in fact uh, um, is uh, max flow and the corresponding cut will be uh, minimal cut. And that cut is very simple to define. As we mentioned, when Ford Falkerson stops, it stops because there are no more augmenting paths. What does this mean? It means that there is no path from S to T. However, there might be a path from S to some of the vertices. For example, here, there is a path from S to uh, V1, and there is also a path to V2, 
in fact, a direct one. There is also a path to uh, V4, uh, namely uh, going first to V2 and then going to uh, V4. On the other hand, there is no path uh, leading to V3 and, of course, no path to T because the algorithm uh, has stopped, right? We couldn't find any more of, um, uh, augmenting paths. So now all the vertices that are reachable will belong to the left-hand side and all the vertices that are not reachable will belong to the, uh, so will belong to the T part of the, the other side of the cut. So now we are going to show that uh, the flow through this network must precisely be equal to the capacity of the minimal cut, right? So why is that so? Uh, it's actually a simple argument based on the fact that uh, all we will show that all the pipes uh, that go from uh, a vertex that is in S to a vertex that is in T must be fully occupied. And all the uh, pipes that go in the opposite direction from a vertex in T to a vertex in S must be completely empty. So why do you think this is the case? Why is it, so what is the definition of S? S are all um, vertices that are reachable in the uh, residual flow graph. So to all of these vertices, so there is a path uh, from S to any of these vertices, and they are only those vertices, uh, precisely those vertices that have a, a path from S to that vertex. So why do you think that uh, the pipe from any of these vertices to a vertex in T must be completely occupied? Exactly. If this vertex, uh, sorry, if this pipe was not fully occupied, if you had some residual capacity left, uh, then this vertex, because this vertex U is uh, reachable from S, uh, if there was a, an extra capacity left here, then the path from S to U can be extended to a path from, uh, um, to the vertex uh, V here. But uh, we are assuming that T is in the opposite side of the cut, namely in the side of vertices that are not reachable from the source. And in the very same way, the, all the pipes in the opposite direction must be completely empty. Why? Because if a pipe is not completely empty in this direction, right, then there would be a virtual pipe in opposite direction, right, from S to T, that is equal to the flow. But this would mean, again, that this vertex here would be reachable from S because this vertex X is reachable from S, and then you can go from X to Y and reach y, and that's impossible by assumption, right? So th what did we show? We showed that all pipes in the right direction are fully occupied, so the flow is equal to these capacities, and in opposite direction, there is no flow whatsoever. But this exactly means that uh, the flow through the network is uh, thr through this cut is precisely equal to the capacity of the cut. So we are in this situation, we found a flow which equals capacity of a cut. And we know that every flow is below or equal to capacity of any cut. So since we found, so since Ford Fulkerson terminates uh, uh, with a cut that is equal uh, with a flow that is equal to a cut, this cut is minimal and the flow through 
and through the network is maximal possible. You see, so no matter how you add augmenting paths, once the algorithm terminates, uh, right, you reach a capacity of a cut, and the, because capacity of the cut is completely independent of any flow, it's a purely geometric notion, right? You look at all possible partitions and you compute the capacities across. No flow is ever mentioned, right? So this means uh, that uh, uh, regardless of how flow is added, uh, if once you fill a cut, uh, this flow must be maximal and this cut must be minimal. Now notice, uh, it might not be the only minimal cut, right? Because maybe some other distribution of flows obtained by some other ordering, some other choice of augmenting paths, it might end, you might end up with a different cut. But this cut must have exactly the same capacity as the one we produce because it always has uh, the minimal possible capacity, right? So Ford Falkerson will always terminate when a capacity of a cut is reached, in which case the flow must be maximal. Do you understand the argument? Any questions? So it's very, very simple, right? What's the structure of the, of the proof? Capacity of any cut, right? Because whatever is transported must go across that cut. Capacity of any cut bounds any flow, right? So every possible flow, legitimate flow, is smaller or equal than capacity of absolutely any possible cut. Now this means that if we find a flow that reaches the capacity of certain of a cut, this flow is maximal possible. Why? Because all other flows must be below the capacity of that minimal cut. So they are all on the left. And all the cuts can have only larger or equal capacity Right, because this is a, a legitimate flow and every cut has capacity bigger or equal than any flow, so all the cuts have to be on the right. So thus, when Ford Falkerson terminates, voila, we reached a max flow and uh, it, the algorithm naturally produces the cut. So for example, if on if someone asks you to find a minimal cut in a, a network flow, you don't inspect by brute force, how would you do it? You would uh, inspect uh, all possible of these many cuts and pick one with the smallest capacity, but that's a bad way of doing it uh, because Ford Falkerson um, will actually find a minimal cut uh, for you. So finding a minimal cut is uh, achieved by simultaneously finding, uh, um, uh, by simultaneously finding the max flow through the graph. Okay, so now important thing is uh, students on the exam are in a hurry and lazy to draw the residual network flows. But they try to do it on the spot on the original graph without drawing separate uh, residual flow. But this is a recipe for a disaster. Now look here. Here is a very simple network, right, with a flow. So it's one out of one, one out of one, one out of one, right? and these two pipes are empty. And it's easy to get confused and say, well, there is no more, there are no more augmenting paths. Why? Well, from S, I cannot reach U because this pipe is fully occupied. And if I go from S to V, I, can no, I cannot reach any 
uh, I cannot reach thing because this pipe is now fully occupied and this uh, pipe is in the, in the wrong direction. So it looks as if there are no more augmenting paths. But clearly, what is max flow in this, uh, in a network like this? It's two because you can pump one liter this way and another liter this way. So where is the error? Why, uh, why is it is not, what's the problem with this argument? Uh, that there are no more uh, augmenting paths. What is augmenting path here? Hmm? You cannot go this way. You cannot go that way. This pipe is in the opposite direction. So how come it looks like one is the, we reached the, the maximal capacity that we can do through the network. What's the, what, the, what is the problem? Exactly. There is an edge in the opposite direction because notice, when you do this flow, now residual network, what does it look like? In this direction, there is no capacity, but you get capacity in the opposite direction. This is empty, so it stays where it is, but now, in this direction, there is no capacity because the pipe is fully occupied. But in the residual network, a edge in the opposite direction appears with capacity equal to the flow. So here you would go, you would get a, uh, uh, you would get a pipe in the opposite direction. And now, of course, in this, uh, Network here is a very simple augmenting path, and if you combine this path, the, path, uh, the flow generated here, what is going to happen? Well, you had a flow in this direction of one. This has flow in the opposite direction of one, so this pipe actually will dry out, right? And you get a, a flow that looks like this. So on the exams, uh, or, or on the final, if there is a problem of this sort, uh, always draw the residual flow network because it's very easy otherwise to miss uh, some of the augmenting paths for, very, uh, uh, for this very reason. And you can now understand why, uh, uh, what's the role of a residual network it's essentially its role to allow you to change your mind and reroute some of the uh, flow that you have already established, right? Because essentially by, if you start with this flow and then add this augmenting path, uh, these amounts of rerouting this flow here and adding the flow in this direction, so a uh, residual flow network, its purpose is literally to um, allow you to reroute the flow, right? By simply uh, reducing the flow in the opposite direction. Okay, so how efficient is uh, ford Falkerson algorithm? So that's the tricky uh, part. In, uh, we said that you can always add augmenting paths in any way you want, right? Well, here is uh, a very simple network flow, very similar to the previous one. You have capacity a thousand and a thousand, right, in all of this, and a thousand here and here, and the capacity of one across. So, since I said you can choose any uh, augmenting path, right? Let's choose the path that uh, goes uh, in this zigzag manner here, right? So here is our first augmenting path. Well, if you add that flow, you will have a flow one out of a thousand this way, one out of a one this way, and one out of a thousand that way. What does 
the residual network flow, residual uh, uh, um, network look like? Well, here in this direction you have capacity 99 and you have capacity of 1 in opposite direction because you can reduce the f this flow of 1 to 0, right? Now, in this direction, you have no capacity because it's 1 out of 1, but you get a, a pipe in the opposite direction, right? And finally here, again, you have capacity 99 and capacity of 1 in this direction. So now, again, if uh, you are free to choose any path, you and you like to zigzag, say you can choose this now, red path, right? What happens now? Well, this flow will generate flow of 1 here. Flow of 1 in opposite direction will offset this flow here, so you will get 0, and you will have a flow of 1 through these pipes. So here it is. Uh, so you have 1 out of 1,000, 1 out of 1,000, 1 over thousand, one of thousand, and zero. And assume now that you choose again the first augmenting path. And you can obviously go back and forth. All what is happening is that you are keeping, is that you keep incrementing for one the flow uh, until you reach uh, max flow, right? So this means that the number of steps, right, can be proportional to the max flow. In this case, uh, the max flow is 2,000, right? Um, you, because you can go a, 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 a thousand this way and that way and a thousand this way and that way, right? So it's 2,000 in each round of iteration, you increase it for one. But notice, this is exponential in the size of the problem. Because all these, how many bits does it take to encode capacity of 1,000? <laughs> Only log too many bits. But your procedure uh, lasts uh, in time that is proportional to the value 1,000, not to the number of bits to encode uh, this 1,000. So Potentially, Ford Folkerson can run in exponential time. And that's a disaster, right? Because it won't converge. Now, uh, there are different ways to fix Ford Folkerson to guarantee polynomiality. And the most famous method is Edmond Scarp method. And uh, Interesting thing about this method is that it is completely counterintuitive. Uh, it looks that it is doing, uh, that the choices that it's making are completely opposite of what it should do. Namely, uh, the, al the algorithm says, uh, in order to choose uh, an augmenting path from S to T, choose Path of minimal length, well, length is counted simply by the number of edges involved in that path. Why is this counterintuitive? Why is it, uh, if you were trying to get to the full capacity of the network as soon as possible, why choosing the shortest path might look like not a very good idea? You see, maybe the shortest path, be it's, it's true, it's shortest, but maybe the pipes involved are dinky little straws. So what you should be looking, prima facie, is uh, you should be looking to find as large pipes as possible, right? But the algorithm actually, instead of doing that, simply chooses the shortest possible path. And lo and behold, it turns out if you do that, uh, then the algorithm will converge in the time that is uh, proportional to number of vertices times edges 
squares, uh, right? But the proof is uh, really, really tricky, right? So uh, one year I showed the proof in class and this didn't go very well with the students. So uh, I relegated it to the extra material. Um, in uh, Corman Laserson uh, uh, Rivers and Stein book, uh, it's, there is a nice description. Essentially, you show that the shortest paths have to increase in length uh, and that uh, uh, the number of times uh, any of the pipes can become uh, the bottleneck pipe is also bounded. And this uh, eventually yields uh, uh, this bound, uh, but the proof is uh, really tricky. And lo and behold, uh, it has two very famous names, especially Karp's name. He's probably the most famous computer scientist today with uh, Steve Cook. Uh, uh, so, uh, so if it deserves to have a name, it must be um, that it's pretty tricky. Okay, uh, at the moment, the fastest mass max flow algorithm to date uh, is a pre flow push algorithm that doesn't involve augmenting paths, but uh, it's the most efficient one because it runs in time vertices cubed. Notice uh, the number of edges uh, is, can be proportional to the square of number of vertices if the network is dense. So this has a potential to be v to the fifth power. Uh, in the uh, textbook, uh, in the textbook, uh, the Tardos and uh, uh, Kleinberg and Tardos textbook, you can find uh, uh, the description of this algorithm. It's um, also quite tricky, um, and. Uh, in terms of implementation, of course, Edmund Scarp is uh, the easiest to implement because this is simply looking for the shortest path, right? So you simply uh, run the algorithm to get the shortest path and uh, uh, it will give you the, it will give you it will guarantee that the, your algorithm will terminate in polynomially many steps. What does it mean polynomially many steps? It's a polynomial in the size of the problem, right? Here, obviously, the size of the problem is um, uh, bounded by the number of vertices uh, and uh, edges and it even doesn't take into account the capacities uh, of the pipes that of course have to be included in the problem description. Um, but um, it, uh, the bound is entirely based on geometry of the graph. So this one is V squared and this one is V cubed. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, okay, so first a few uh, variations of, uh, of max flow. Uh, sometimes you want to allow uh, to have both uh, multiple sources and multiple things. And you want again to find max flow. Well, this is uh, easy to reduce uh, to, the prob to the case when single uh, source and single sink. How do we do that? Uh, well, you simply add a vertex, you call it super source, and you connect it, oops, uh, you connect it to all of the real sources in the graph. You connect it with pipes of infinitely large capacity. If you don't like infinity, you take the capacity to be, say, some total of the capacities of all existing pipes. Uh, that's good enough as infinity here, right? And you do exactly the same trick when you have several uh, sinks, you produce a super sink. Now, when I find min cut in this graph, 
Uh, is it possible that uh, some of the sources end up that some of the that sources do not end up in the same uh, side of the cut? Can it happen that uh, the cut is such that it contains uh, S1, but S2 and S3 are in the opposite side? <coughs> Can this happen for a mean cut? What do you think? Can, can it happen that after you do Ford Volkerson, it turns out that uh, uh, S1 ended up in one side and uh, the other two ended up in the other side? No, why? Exactly. The capacity of this pipe is infinite, so no way that they can be involved in the minimal cut, right? Even if you place here the sum of capacities of all uh, real pipes, of course, then clearly um, a minimal cut cannot uh, go through uh, these edges. So you have a guarantee that all sources will stay on the side of the super source and all sinks will say stay on the size of the super sink, right? And this makes... Uh, uh, the problem uh, more realistic, maybe S's are oil wells and T's are refineries and you want to maximize the throughput uh, from uh, all of the oil wells uh, through to all of the refineries, right? This is naturally formulated with multiple sources and multiple sinks, but uh, uh, as we have just explained, uh, um, it cannot happen, um, I mean, it reduces a, to, the, uh, to the problem with a single source uh, and uh, a single sink. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, max flow algorithms are extremely useful, not for just transportation problems that are naturally formulated uh, as max flow problems, but they can solve problems that prima facie do not uh, involve uh, uh, any flow of any kind, right? So the best example for this is uh, uh, finding a maximal match in a bipartite graph. So what is a bipartite graph? It's a graph that you can naturally split into two subsets, right? So that all edges have one end in one of the subsets and uh, the other end uh, in the other subset. So here, this vertical partition would be precisely like this. And your task is... Uh, um, to find a maximal matching. What is a maximal matching? You want to choose the largest possible number of edges that do not share any vertices, uh, right? So for example, if you are uh, running a, a dating agency and the edges uh, uh, encode that uh, these two people uh, are potentially made that they like each other and you want to uh, maximize the number of uh, potential couples that you can form that of course uh, uh, reduces precisely to the problem of uh, finding um, maximal matching, right? Reduces to a problem of finding maximal matching. So how do we do that? What do you think? How would you uh, reduce uh, this problem to a max flow problem? What would be the strategy? How would you reduce maximal matching to a max flow problem? Think a little bit. Huh? Say, if we put the capacities uh, of all edges, if we put capacities equal to one, right? 
if all capacities are equal to one, then a maximal matching would correspond to maximal flow from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. If you just imagine that uh, these guys are all uh, uh, sources and all of these guys are all sinks, uh, then uh, uh, we can reduce it to, um, to a max flow problem by doing the trick that we just mentioned. First, we can reduce it to a single source by adding uh, uh, edges from the super source to all of the sources and then uh, and adding edges from all of the sinks into the uh, super sink. And this now looks like a, um, uh, like a network, right? Flow network. Uh, you put, so all of the edges have unit uh, uh, capacity, right? So um, then clearly this is a cut if you split uh, the vertices vertically here. And then clearly uh, what you want to maximize is uh, if you maximize the flow, because all of the pipes have unit capacity, this amounts precisely to picking the largest possible um, matching, right? Uh, the largest possible matching because the flow will be uh, as large as uh, how many uh, pipes you manage to fill, right? So maximizing the number of uh, uh, pipes uh, precisely amounts to um, maximizing the flow because all the flow is uh, just unit, right? And notice again, um, it looks like, so at the end, all of the, fl uh, all of the flows will just, uh, all of the paths that are occupied will have a length three. But uh, as you apply for Folkerson method, can you have augmenting paths of length larger than three? What do you think? So for example, say this is my flow at the moment. What is the residual network flow for this flow in this network? Well, this is unoccupied, so you have it still available. Uh, this is now fully occupied, right? But uh, you have capacity in the opposite direction, right? Uh, then you have regular capacity to, through this pipe, and again, capacity in opposite direction because you have flow of one through both of these pipes. And lo and behold, notice now that uh, this uh, augmenting path is actually pretty long. You would go this way to this vertex, then from this vertex you go back here, then you go to this vertex, then you go back here and back to this vertex, and finally here. So it's actually the augmenting paths can be much larger, right? And after you do that, you will in fact achieve max flow because three of these will occupy them. That's the best what you can do. So this is yet another example uh, that in fact, uh, um, Residual network flow simply allows you to change your mind, to reroute some of the flow that you already put in. So once you put some flow, it's not uh, written in stone, right? Uh, residual uh, network flow, uh, augmenting paths to residual net network flow, the pipes that go in opposite direction of the direction of the um, uh, of the pipe, right, allow you essentially to change your mind and reroute some of the flow through, uh, through the pipe to different pipes. And lo and behold here, it in fact produces the, uh, 
max flow. Yes. So uh, the so in the uh, yes so you kind of cancel the flows in opposite direction is if this is what you because how do we uh, uh, how do we calculate the the flow max flows you remember there was an example. In the very here, here, for example, um, here you have a flow of one. So in the residual network flow, it will show as capacity of one. And uh, as you, yes, when you uh, add network flow, you always subtract the flow in opposite direction. So you keep consistency. Okay, so. Let's just look at another example that shows how useful, gee, even my computer is faster than this one. Um, okay, here is an, uh, an interesting example that uh, um, can be solved using max flow. So, um, Assume that you have a movie rental agency, right? And you have a certain number of movies in stock, and for each movie you know how many uh, copies of that movie you have. So this was obviously devised uh, during good old times when uh, you go to a blockbuster and you got a, a, a tape, right? Were you born when this was uh, taking place? You were, amazing, good. <laughs> oh, yeah, not with tapes, with uh, compact discs, that's right. Okay, so, um, so, and you have certain number of customers, uh, and just like uh, uh, these agencies, you limit how many movies uh, uh, each of the customer, each customer can take out at, uh, any time, right? So say here it is five movies uh, um, per customer. And uh, you have the requests. So your customer sent you requests. For example, customer uh, U1 wants to see movie M1 and wants to see movie M3, right? This guy uh, is... Uh, uh, he is a student, but he would rather watch movies than uh, study for the final. So his, uh, his list has uh, uh, four movies that he wants to see. I don't know any moment in time if there are uh, four movies worth seeing, but uh, that's another story. So... Um, so here, this... Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, each node represents uh, a movie title. And this number here... So you have M1 many copies of uh, uh, this movie. You have M2 many copies uh, of the second movie. M3 many copies of the third movie. Right? Okay. So now, but each movie might be requested by several users. Uh, so if you have, say, three copies and five users wants to see it, uh, you can only assign three uh, copies, right? Because this is how many physical copies you have. And you have to decide who gets to see what in such a way the total number of movies rented is as large as possible because notice giving uh, one movie uh, to a user reduces availability for that movie for other users and of course giving that movie to a user also reduces how many movies he can take so now you want to somehow decide uh, which movie you give to each user so that some total 
of m movies rented out is as large as uh, possible. And uh, for some strange reason, right, uh, for some strange reason, um, students on the final probably those that never bother to even look at these scores during the year decide to do it by a greedy method, right? They say, okay, let me find the movie, uh, the user who requested the fewest movies and the movie that is requested by the fewest users. And lo and behold, for all these kind of greedy choices, you can come up with a counterexample uh, that uh, it doesn't yield uh, an uh, optimal um, solution, okay? So um, this is an ideal example of uh, a problem that is, of course, has nothing to do with uh, max flow, but that can be solved by a max flow algorithm. How do we do that? Well, uh, as we mentioned, we connect all of the users, we treat them as uh, sources, and uh, uh, we connect them with a super source, S, right? And uh, uh, we uh, connect all of the movies uh, uh, with the super sync, okay? Even though it's illogical, maybe Movies should be sources uh, and user things, but uh, what the heck. Um, so now what are the capacities? You see, now each pipe to each user gets a capacity that is equal to the largest number of movies that a user is uh, allowed to rent, uh, right? So here, if it's uh, five movies, uh, each of these pipes will have capacity five. On the other hand, uh, the capacities of uh, these pipes will be set to be precisely equal to the number of physical copies of the movie that you have, right? And capacities of all pipes uh, between the, uh, users uh, and the movies that indicate the preferences, right? Uh, so remember, each of these uh, pipes means that uh, uh, this user has uh, sent you a request to see uh, these uh, four movies, right? And you set all of these pipes to capacity one. And now clearly, uh, the flow through the network, if you look, consider this cut, of course this is not a mean cut, it need not be the mean cut, but if you consider this cut, right? Then clearly the flow through uh, this uh, network will be precisely equal if you always have a flow that is an integer, right? So here it can be either zero or one, um, then um, the max flow here will be precisely achieved when you manage to occupy as many pipes as possible, right? So you want to occupy as many uh, pipes as possible, and this is, of course, will be a maximal matching in this bipartite graph. Um, and how would you solve this problem? You would simply run Ford Falkerson uh, algorithm to find uh, maximal flow uh, through this uh, network, right? Uh, once you find maximal flow, you will see which pipes are occupied. Okay, so why is it not possible that uh, uh, our algorithm assigns uh, a flow of one half through this end uh, and flow of one half this end. Obviously you cannot, uh, uh, what would this correspond to? This user gets half of this movie and half of that movie. So what is a guarantee that the flows will be always zero or one? 
how do we add flow uh, in Ford Folkerson algorithm? What is, uh, how much can you pump through a uh, augmenting path? By of course, by integer, because uh, you always pump whatever is the bottleneck capacity of the path. And here, obviously, the bottleneck capacity will be one, so there is no way that you can have a fractionally occupied um, pipes, okay? So there is no fractionally occupied pipes. Uh, so once you find max flow, you will uh, then produce a maximal, I mean, it's not really maximal matching because, but you will find uh, a matching that satisfies the constraint uh, that uh, on each left side at most five uh, edges are chosen and for every movie at most uh, the corresponding number M of movies uh, are uh, chosen. And there are gazillions of uh, uh, examples that, um, other examples that you can uh, solve uh, using max flow algorithms. Let us make a short break now and then we continue.
okay, just because it's uh, really tempting to do this movie business uh, uh, by greedy, just to show you that uh, um, kind of greedy doesn't work. You see, for example, you see, when you decide to assume that these are your users and these are your movies, and you have only one copy of each movie, you see, giving a movie to a user reduces availability of that movie for other users. So, for example, here, if you give this movie to that user and this movie to this user, that's about it if every user can, ta can take out only one movie. But you see, in this uh, distribution here, if you give this movie instead of giving it to this user, if you give it to that user, and this movie you give to this user, now you can give that movie to the third user and you gave away uh, three movies rather than only two. And you can imagine uh, if uh, the network is much larger, then it's really uh, not easy to see how to distribute things optimally. And this is where uh, max flow kicks in. Okay, so that's, um, that's about this. And uh, uh, what did I want? Oh, yes, when you compute mean cut, uh, once you finish the Ford Fulkerson, only honest to God edges uh, count, right? So the, uh, the you, on the residual uh, network flow, you simply verify which vertices are accessible and which ones are not. Uh, once you split them, you go to the original graph, right? The original network graph, and then it's easy to see uh, to look what uh, goes across the cut and compute the capacity of that cut. Uh, so only uh, honest to God, uh, uh, the, you know, the residual network is auxiliary for a routing flow, right? But uh, uh, after you find augmenting path, you update um, your original network uh, flow. Okay, so next topic that we are going to do is, uh, okay, so let's do first an example that uh, uh, was once on the final of max flow, okay? Say you have the following problem. Uh, you have a computer network. Uh, and you have a bunch of computers connected in, in that uh, network. And uh, uh, what happens is uh, uh, that uh, suddenly you realize, and so you are given uh, the capacity in kilobits per second of each, uh, each link, right? And uh, what happens, you then realize that uh, a few of the, of the computers are attacking uh, some, of the co some other computers. So here are the attackers. Uh, these two say, and these two are victims. Uh, and what you want to do, it's a real emergency. You want to disconnect some of the links uh, so that there is no path anymore from the attackers to the victims. Uh, but of course, uh, disconnecting the links uh, costs you, so you want to find, uh, you want to disconnect as few links as possible to separate uh, the attackers from the victims. How would you solve this problem? So you are given the graph with capacities in kilobits per second, and uh, uh, you are given, you know who the attackers are and who the victims are, and you want to disconnect, uh, say, if you disconnect this link, then this attacker can no longer attack this guy, and if you disconnect, say, this link, now this 
neither of the two, as far as I can see, can attack either this or that. How would you find the minimal number of links that you can disconnect that um, uh, so minimal number of links that you disconnect to separate attackers from the victims. How would you solve this problem? Any ideas? Okay, we will first construct a super sink. Okay, and uh, probably it's a good idea to construct a super source. Now, what will be the capacities of, how would we put the weights here? Hmm? You put the weights to be infinity to make sure that, uh, okay, what what do we do with the, the weights that are capacities here? We want to disconnect minimal number of links to separate the attackers from the victims. Do the capacities here really matter anything? Yes, exactly. So you will ignore the capacities and what weight will you put on each edge? Weight one, exactly. So you put weight one everywhere and then you find max flow through this network which will generate a mean cut and then of course uh, you will, this will give you precisely the smallest number of uh, edges that, uh, the smallest number. So here, the smallest capacity is just counting the number of edges that you have to disconnect. Very good. Okay, how about this problem? <coughs> so assume, God forbid, that there was some Earthquake, which reminds me when the earthquake happened in New Zealand, my late mom called me and asked me if I was okay. And I asked her, well, there wasn't an earthquake in Australia, it was in New Zealand. She said, yeah, but that's nearby. <laughs> so I guess for mothers, everything is uh, a danger. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, I'll tell you the funny, uh, well, no, I won't tell you. <laughs> okay, that's too much. Uh, tell me, uh, assume that you have a, uh, um, so these are your victims, uh, right? Uh, well, these are your buildings, say collapsed buildings. My goodness, this is really morbid. I should have come up with a better example. And uh, you know how many injured people there are. And then you have a bunch of hospitals, right? And you know the capacity uh, of each hospital, right? And uh, the rule is, uh, that each person has to be uh, transported to a hospital that is not farther than, uh, say, uh, uh, whatever, 20 kilometers. And your question is, uh, how would you distribute, how would you find out whether you can distribute all patients to all hospitals without overloading any of the hospitals and if it's not possible, your algorithm should return um, that that's not possible. How would you solve this problem? So you know how many patients in each building, you know the distances between all the buildings uh, and uh, hospitals, and you have capacities of all hospitals. Again, uh, the, um, 
I, I at least uh, one third, well not one third, maybe 10% of uh, answers or the final people just try to do it with greedy. Okay, but this is not the worst. I don't know who, maybe this person is hopefully not here, but on the midterm, what was the most spectacular answer? So for the extended part was this problem when you have a coin and you have to simulate a die, right? And the question was, what is the expected number of throws to simulate a die? And uh, one uh, uh, student uh, uh, came up with the answer one third and no alarm bell uh, was ringing, so. Um, but that's not the worst, you know, I, uh, a colleague of mine, Sri, probably are taking his computer engineering courses. Uh, he, uh, on a final, he had to, uh, students had to estimate the power of consumption of a chip. And why student came up with uh, an answer five megawatts. <laughs> So it's, uh, every number is a number. It's as good as any other number. I don't know why you are shocked. <laughs> okay. So whenever you do something, you always think whether what am I, what I'm doing is right. So how would you solve this problem with uh, injured people and hospitals? How would you reduce it to a max flow problem? So first we have to somehow connect the patients with hospital. When do you connect a patient to a hospital? Exactly, so there will be an edge just in case uh, uh, the person is at most 20 kilometers away from the hospital, good. So if these are now sinks and these are the sources, uh, we should make a super sink and a super source. So what do you think? What is the capacity of each of these pipes? Exactly, it's the capacity of the hospital because this will prevent, when you take max flow, uh, this will prevent uh, exceeding the, the capacity. Uh, what is the capacity of each edge? Don't tell me this can be one half and this can be one half. So this guy, half of him can go <laughs> here and another half can go here. <laughs> so what are the capacities? Uh, how many hospitals can each person go to? Just one. So all of these will be of unit capacity. How about connecting a super, um, super source to the original sources? Uh, what will be the capacity of each of these uh, pipes? Uh, what do you think? Uh, this is the number of people at that location. So that's exactly what will be. So this will be an I where this is the number of injured people at I location. And now you simply do max flow. And uh, um, when you do the max flow, you will simply check if every person has, where he's, he has been sent, right? Which of the pipes is occupied. And if uh, for every person there exists uh, one non-empty pipe. So this will tell you whether it's possible to, to distribute people. So you see all sorts of logistics problems can be in fact solved uh, using uh, max flow. And as I say, this uh, pre-flow uh, uh, relabel algorithm runs in time V cube, which is uh, feasible for uh, quite a large number of uh, uh, vertices. So these are very, these are very practically, um, uh, practically useful algorithms. Okay, so a similar problem would be
So you have a bunch of families, right? And they go to a, a restaurant, and in order for them to socialize, uh, uh, you can put uh, at most one uh, family member uh, to each uh, table. Uh, so here are your tables and here are your families. So say here you have a four-member family and then you have Catholics, here are a 12-member family. Uh, and uh, these guys are Protestants, if you've seen the meaning of life. Uh, okay, so how would you distribute people to tables so that uh, uh, no two people from the same family go to the same table? You get the idea. What will be the sources? What will be the things? Sources are families, sinks are tables, and of course the capacity, you put a super uh, source and a super sink, and uh, again the number of family members will be the capacity of that uh, uh, pipe, and then uh, each of these pipes will be capacity one because only one family member can go to, to a table, uh, and what will be the capacities of uh, uh, pipes from tables to the sink? Sorry? Size of the table. How many people can sit uh, uh, on, uh, on each table? So you get the idea. It's uh, quite versatile. You can solve uh, lots of problems using max flow. Okay, next thing that we want to do is uh, string matching. Alex. Yes. Sorry? Yes. Uh, how do you, well, uh, okay, so there are versions for this with weights uh, that, but they are quite uh, tricky. Uh, there is an algorithm that uh, uh, assume that you have a max flow problem. Uh, as I mentioned with Ford Fulkerson, uh, you might get different distribution of flows uh, um, for different choices of augmenting paths. But assume now that uh, there is a cost for flow from uh, one point to another point. Uh, so some transportation links are cheaper than the other, and then your goal is to find the cheapest max flow. So you want to maximize flow, but with all different distributions, uh, uh, you want to find the cheapest one, and unfortunately, the algorithm is not simple generalization in which you always add uh, uh, cheapest augmenting path, unfortunately. Uh, so that's a pretty tricky, if I'm not mistaken, either Tardos book or, uh, or, um, or Corman book has the solution for this problem. But uh, there are versions, uh, uh, I mean, uh, max flow problems because of their practical importance have been studied uh, uh, in great depth. So there are all sorts of variations. Okay, since you are here, uh, okay, assume now that you want to solve max flow problem, okay? You want to, so, uh, to answer more your question, just to show you a kind of variance that uh, can exist for max flow. So assume that you have a flow network, uh, right? Um, but uh, besides capacities, uh, you have also capacities of edges, uh, sorry, of vertices. Uh, so capacity of vertex, of vertex, which tells you how much in total can go through this vertex. So uh, without capacity here, in principle, uh, there is a possibility to saturate all, you know, to, to push as much as the inbound capacity allows you and mean of that and uh, the capacity of the outgoing, right? But assume now that you have a limited capacity 
that can go through a vertex. Uh, how would you solve this problem? Yes. Very good. Uh, so what you do is uh, you simply split a vertex into two vertices. All incoming capacities go this way, or outgoing capacities go that way, and the capacity of this uh, between the uh, so I split this vertex into two, and this will be capacity of the vertex, right? Now this pipe simulates uh, uh, capacity of the uh, node. So you can see with a little bit of ingenuity, you can actually tweak all of these problems. There are also tricks when you multiply, when you uh, clone the edges if uh, there is temporal uh, dependency if, say, one day uh, you have certain uh, uh, capacity and then next day the capacity changes. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have time uh, uh, for these refinements. Uh, the baseline algorithm is one that is practically uh, used more often. And it's not that uh, complicated to... Um, uh, to actually tweak uh, the problems into the, you know, the, into uh, just like what we did here with the splitting of the vertices to, um, to adapt the algorithm for this. Okay, next, any other questions? Yes? Sorry? Yes. So, uh, the, so the nodes are, left side of the graph is these, the right side are these guys. So all the edges go, is bipartite, right? Go from families to tables, right? Um, and then you have super source and super thing, but there are no links between tables, uh, right? It's all between uh, um, families and uh, tables. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, wait, wait, for which problem? Yes, 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 yes. So, so all the capacities are one, but you see you want to keep a super, super thing. You put it uh, infinity because you don't want, uh, uh, you see, so you want to make sure that when you find the min cut that all the attacking computers are here, all the victims are here. So super source must have then infinite capacity to prevent a cut going like this. So if you have an infinite capacity here, this is a guarantee that all the attacking uh, uh, computers will be on the size, side of the, uh, of the source. And uh, similarly here, uh, because uh, all the victims are also joined with an infinite capacity, then all of the victims will stay on this side. Uh, how do you guarantee the Well, because uh, uh, the minimal cut, uh, so because the capacity is a unit, right? Uh, and you count only if these are uh, directional links, right? Uh, then uh, the minimal cut will be precisely the number because uh, if they all have unit capacity, minimal cut will be exactly the one that has minimal number of edges uh, that go across, uh, right? So uh, this is the, the trick to reduce uh, uh, if you put capacities one, then minimal cut reduces it just to counting how many edges uh, go across. Uh, yeah, very good. Yes? But with the tiny matrix, 
Yes. Uh, it's one, right? Because uh, the idea was that one family member, only one family member can go to a, uh, to a table. Okay. Any other questions? So what we are going to do, uh, I guess on Friday, uh, we are going to do um, string matching. I don't know if it makes sense to start it now. Because, well, I guess we have 10 minutes. We can just start. I can tell you what the problem is. Uh, uh, and then next week, we will only practice dynamic programming, max, uh, max flow, and maybe string matching so that I prepare you for the final. And then I will have office hours. Probably I'll try this very room so that uh, you can ask questions before the, when is the final? Why is it? Did they announce the calendar uh, for finals? 23rd. Okay. So I'll have in this break, I'll have uh, um, office hours so that you can come and bug me if you have problems with the material. So on the final, you will have only, uh, only Dynamic programming, max flow, string matching, um, and no uh, meter material at all. Okay, so string matching. What is string matching? So assume that you want to find if, say, a gene is present in an organism. Right? And assume that you sequenced uh, this uh, DNA of this organism. You essentially have to search uh, through the entire length of the DNA if a particular sequence uh, appears in the length, uh, in the genome. Okay? So here is a very long. Uh, sequence and then another sequence that can be also quite long but of course much shorter this can be in billions and this can be say in thousands right and you want to see whether you can match it uh, within the whether you can find the match within the long sequence of contiguous, right? So they have to be consecutive uh, to find the match. And this sequence can be sufficiently long that it cannot sit in a single register, right? Which makes it complicated. Uh, in fact, maybe so long that uh, it cannot sit in all of the available registers, right? So you would somehow, you want to somehow uh, find uh, a smarter way of matching on searching for, the, uh, for this sequence than just brute force trying and then moving one ahead and trying again uh, and so forth. So this is the problem. Now, assume just for, you know, when you are looking for a gene, each gene can have a very small number, maybe one or two mutations, right? Assume that uh, you have at most, say, two mutations. How would you search uh, for a gene with a mutation? Think about that. That's uh, so when you can always kind of either drop or have a gap or have a gap here. Now, the idea, to, we will talk about this uh, uh, later, how to do a search when you allow small differences and you want to ignore small differences. So 
how to do this efficiently. Idea is very clever, right? So the problem here, primary problem is that this can be longer than the size of uh, available registers, right? So it's hard to do brute force uh, comparison. And uh, uh, this is an excellent example of how you combine techniques uh, that we learned so far. This will be a combination of hashing and recursion. So, um, so let's set up the, the problem. Uh, assume that the string A and B are in an alphabet A with D many symbols in total. First thing that uh, um, we want to do is the following trick. Yes, exactly. So A, capital A, the script A is a language, um, and uh, D is the number of symbols in that language. To make things simple, uh, we will map every symbol into its index. So instead of looking at some generic symbols uh, that can be, say, later letters, uh, A, T, G, um, C, right, for genetics, you would... Uh, uh, simply have numbers from zero uh, to D. So, yeah, I really feel reluctant. I, we have five minutes. I don't want this to um, to speed it up. Uh, let's continue on Friday uh, because it's there is no time to do anything. Uh,